Thank you all for coming. Um, this is the 100th year of the National Football League. And just recently, the NFL has voted on the top plays in NFL history. And number one is the immaculate reception. Number two is the catch. I don't think there's been a more impactful play, though, than the catch because of what it meant to the 49ers, what it meant to this area, and, and kind of the, the, the groundwork that it laid for one of sports great dynasties through the 80s and the early part of the 90s. The thing that probably made it really special from the standpoint of the 49ers fans was the person who did it. Dwight Clark really embraced his role in not only 49ers history, but also in NFL history. And I know, where's Matt? I know that he was a neighbor uh, to Matt here, but anybody who came across him, he just loved to talk about this play. He loved to talk about you. He, he just, he ate it up. There was a, a point when he was uh, diagnosed with ALS where he told me that he would love to put a book together of all the great experiences uh, that people lived through at the time of the catch. He loved to hear the stories, and I think the reason he loved to hear the stories, I know the reason he loved to hear the stories, was because he really felt that all the experiences of the fans at that moment was part of the story. It wasn't just him jumping up and catching a touchdown pass from Joe Montana that propelled the 49ers to their first Super Bowl championship. His feeling was what you experienced on your couch, uh, crashing through a plate glass window and having to go to the emergency room, which is a story that, that, that's in the book. Um, you know, the, the, the impact that that play had be, with a daughter and a, and a grandfather, with a, with a son and a father, all that stuff, everything that people experienced was every bit as much a part of the catch as the actual catch. And he, he understood that and he fully embraced that. So he asked for letters to be written from his fans and I put the word out for people to send in letters. And I got a lot of letters. And two weeks before he passed away, I had the opportunity along with Brad, who took some great shots, some great photos of Dwight, captured him through uh, his battle with the disease and how people from across the country, his former teammates, former staff members, friends, would have lunches with him. And Brad was entrusted to capture those lunches uh, and a lot of Brad's photos are what you're, you're going to see here in a little bit. But on that day when we read the letters to Dwight Clark, myself, Keena Turner, Ronnie Lott, Brian Murphy, and some others, when we read those letters to Dwight, one of the things he, said, he asked me was, do you think this can be a book? And I said, Dwight, I'm not sure it can be a book, but... I know that I can do a really good job uh, with the resources I have at NBC Sports Air Bay Area to do a documentary. So what you're gonna see right now is the documentary that we did from the NBC Sports Bay Area producer, Sean Madison did a phenomenal job. And then we'll talk a little bit more uh, after this documentary. So here it is, Letter to 87. I've often 
thought that I, if I could get the word out somehow to get the stories, I should put a book together of, of the stories that these 49er fans live through at that moment. Hopefully long after I'm gone, um, 49er fans will still enjoy that, that play and that year and the, that team that uh, started it all off. I was on my back. <laughs> and uh, when I let the ball go, I thought it, it was a touchdown anyway. And I heard the crowd roar, and then um, I remember distinctly getting over to the sideline, and, and the guy who was never out there, Chico Norton, was ne never on the sideline. Boy, he came up to me and said, boy, your buddy saved your ass that time. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about, Chico? He goes, well, he jumped out of the stadium to make a great catch, because I hadn't seen it yet. And he said, and I go, ah, he can't jump. He's white, Chico, come on. I think that when he wanted fans to express their feelings, that's what he was trying to capture. He was trying to capture the same feeling that he had when he did it. And how did they feel? And were they as excited as he was? And I think that in life, he felt that he could do those type of things to really um, let people know that just like, it, just like it mattered to him, that that was one of the greatest moments in his life. the great fortune and joy of experiencing the birth of three children, travels, a wonderful career in pediatric nursing, but can I just say that the catch is such an indelible moment in my life, rivaled by no other. Through the years, we had watched the Cowboys take us apart time after time. To this day, I can't stand the sight of those Cowboys. So to witness your hands reaching for the stars and the moon, and to come down with that football in your hands, in the end zone, it doesn't get any better than that. The laughter, the tears, the cries of sheer happiness that followed the catch of all catches, never to be surpassed by any play to this day. Nothing can ever come close. It was the true pinnacle. The Super Bowls were fantastic, but the miracle of that play was the best thing that ever happened to our 49ers, and thus to the fans. Not only were you an amazing athlete, professional and dedicated in every respect, but your modest, warm, and genial demeanor carried it to the level of perfection. Dwight, you have our highest esteem and our gratitude. We love you. I was standing on the sideline like everybody, you know, all my teammates, at the furthest end from that end zone. And as the play kind of started to, you know, show, I'm, I'm like everybody else. You know, what's going to happen? Where's the ball going? And when, jo when Joe released it, I didn't know where it was going. I kind of thought, like a lot of folks, it was going to be incomplete. And kind of out of nowhere, you know, uh, from my eyesight, right, because I'm watching Joe, and as the ball is released, I'm watching the ball, and all out of nowhere, there's Dwight, you know? And uh, now, the defensive player in me is like, okay, now we gotta go hold him. You know, so I couldn't, I couldn't get immersed in the moment, because I'm like, okay, we got, now we gotta go hold him. Like many, I have very special memories around that championship game and the catch. I was right out of high school working as a teller at a bank, 
A guy came up to my window and was withdrawing a large amount of money. It was none of my business, but I asked him what he needed all the cash for. He said he had friends waiting in line up at the stick to get tickets for the game on Sunday. Jokingly, I said, hey, if you score some extra tickets, you know, I'd love to buy them for him. I was shocked when he walked back into the bank the next day and sold me two tickets at face value. Turns out he was a San Jose cop. I called my father at work, which I never did. I asked him what he was doing on Sunday, and he replied, what the hell do you think I'm doing? I'm watching the ball game. I then asked him, I thought maybe you might rather take a ride up to the city with me. He paused for a moment and he said, you didn't. And I said, oh yes I did. These many years have passed and my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's about seven years ago. The bad news is he no longer has firsthand memories of the, the game that day. The good news is we often watch the video of the catch and I tell him the story of that day and it's like he's experiencing it for the first time. It never fails to bring a smile to his face and it's a memory I will hold on to for the rest of my life. Dave Mentick, San Jose. What happened that day meant a lot to everybody, and not just 49er fans, but fans of football, fans of the NFL, and uh, again, you're gonna go down in history, and you're, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna be a part of the NFL's history forever. Dearest Dwight, when I was born, I was the first grandchild of my generation and my family. I think my grandpa wanted a boy, but he got me instead. You see, my grandpa and grandma had four girls and no boys, but from the beginning, he loved me so much, and I loved him right back. He would give me the world if he could, a candy bar, watch whatever I wanted on TV, sure, with only one exception. I could never watch anything on Sunday because of stupid football. How dare football encroach on the total and complete spoiling of me by my beloved grandfather. I learned more about football every game. Soon I began to be able to call the penalties before they were announced. I was hooked, and man, I hated the Cowboys. Sunday of the championship game, I had to babysit my next door neighbor's daughter. Oh, I was upset. I could not get out of it to watch with my grandpa. I was right next door, but I wanted to be cheering, yelling, probably cursing a little, <laughs> as we all did. And then magic happened. You caught it, you caught it. I threw my hands up, I was screaming. I fell to my knees in front of the TV. The kid I was babysitting looked at me like I was completely bonkers. Are you okay? I said, yes, we're going to the Super Bowl for the very first time ever. And it was wonderful once I got to see my grandpa. We celebrated for a long time after that and through the Super Bowl, my grandpa and I would cheer like crazy every Sunday together, and it really shaped my life. Uh, I don't think I would have been as close to him without football. Love is what life is all about, and joy makes the moments in our life special. Thank you for the special moments and the love that you have given to me and to Niner Nation. Love you always, Dwight. Lorraine Round, San Jose. A lot of still a lot of snow on the ground and uh, um, it was cold <laughs> it was really cold we got out of the van and he says hey we gotta we gotta go shopping I need I need some boots and gloves and a bigger coat so we did that that day we got a pretty cute picture of him at Cabela's with a cowboy hat and a big old jacket he looked looked like a rancher as he looked around and you know saw you know the beauty of this place and then when we went inside it was like i mean you see the little kids at christmas when they come down the stairs and they see the enormity of the presence under the tree and that's how he was when he 
was wheeling through the, the house. It was just, it was amazing. It was like he had been unleashed. Even though he was confined to a chair, he could go anywhere in his house that he wanted to. He could see all this beauty, which he just absolutely loved. One of the absolutely best things for him was to watch his wife Kelly ride the horses and you know all these windows. He, he would sit from his office to the living room to the, the kitchen and just follow her. She would ride out of view, he'd move to the next room and pick her back up again. And as it warmed up and you know the snow all melted, we'd come out here to the deck and, and him and I would sit and have a cocktail and watch Kelly ride. <laughs> he'd sit here and he'd go, I, I can't believe I own a horse ranch because I feel like I got a pack. I'm on vacation. You know, dude, you own a horse ranch. This is yours. He was really excited about that day because of the letters um, that, you know, were going to be read from his fans. You know, his fans were so important to him that that was one of the things he really embraced and really wanted to share was those, those moments with his fans. So he was excited about the day. The day came and, and that morning, it was a rough day, it was a rough morning. He was struggling a lot, having a hard time, you know, catching his breath and, and speaking. Everybody came in, Dwight was, Dwight was in bed. So, um, you know, it was, it was one of those days he didn't even really have the energy to get in, get in his chair and move around. Yeah, yeah, he was struggling, he really was. But, you know, when everybody got there and we set chairs around the bed and, you know, he propped himself up and, and uh, you know, they started talking and telling stories and you could just see the, the color change in his face, smiles back, you know, he was laughing and, uh, you know, as the letters were being read, he was just, he was really in awe of the things, a lot of the things that were said. Some of the letters were pretty funny too, so, you know, we all had good laughs about, about a few of them discussing the cowboys in certain language. I have always lived in Ohio, so being a football fan of the 49ers has never been a popular choice among friends. Boy, is that the truth? So I watched my very first football game. That date, that game, just happened to be January 10th, 1982. The closest to a superhero flying out of the sky to save the day, Chris Logan, Hudson, Ohio. My good friend Pierce was the first to hit the floor. <laughs> then the darndest thing happened. Every single one of us, at least 30 people, jumped onto the pile. Peter Ford, San Jose. And Nan, remember, she was 79. She came out of the chair and actually jumped a few inches off the floor. Bill Dow, Auburn, California. At the time, I was a smoker. I was so excited jumping up and down when you made that astonishing catch that I burned a hole in my ski jacket and never got it fixed. It still has the catch hole in it. Pat Janakis. After the game, heading south on 101, I kept yelling out the passenger side of the window, they're going to the super effing bowl. It's Scott Blake from Medford, Oregon. I jumped up to high five my roommate at the University of Oregon and we both fell against the window. <laughs> it broke and I still have a scar on my knee and on my left ring finger. Matthew McCone, Modesto. You launched that dynasty with the catch and inspired an entire fan base. I know your life is more than a catch. You caught more touchdowns and made many more plays, but that was something special. Travis Black, Battle Creek, Michigan. My dad jumped up, went backwards, and wound up knocking himself out. Rizal Carter, the second, Bellevue, Washington. He seemed to grow you know, more in strength and spirit. And uh, the day just continued on that way 
and I can see, you know, his energy picking up just through, you know, hearing those, those letters being read. Dwight, in a way, you reached out to a foreigner who wasn't comfortable and gave him a solace and helped him fit in. This, in turn, made me a Niners fan from my birth. Daniel Roman, San Jose, California. We moved to Southern California in 1979 from NorCal. Back then, there were no highlights or internet. We look at the stats, but there were no pictures attached. Truth to be told, until the 80s, due to no TV coverage in SoCal, we thought Dwight Clark, who was making these catches in the stats, was a speedy little black receiver <laughs> from Clemson. True story. <laughs> Chris does stay Simi Valley, California. Being the good sister that I am, my brother was watching, so I did too. He was jumping up and down, yelling at the TV, rooting for the Cowboys. I loved red and gold, but I didn't have a clue as to what was supposed to happen in football. However, every time my brother jumped up and down, I yelled, go 49ers. The more I yelled, the angrier he got. That started the best sibling rivalry ever. Melissa Helmos, Los Gatos, California. I was born and raised in Marin County and still live there today. But for one year in 1981, at the age of 13, my father got transferred to Dallas, Texas. The 49ers were my link back home. January 10th, 1982 comes around and I'm across the street in a big executive house full of cowboy fans. I was wearing my 49ers jersey a drop of red and a sea of blue. When you caught that goddamn ball, 50 Cowboys fans fell to their knees, gasping in pure anguish, and I jumped nearly as high as you, screaming at the top of my lungs with my arms in the air. Bobby Grabian, Novato. He got all of us in that room that day to feel, you know, how lucky were, were we that we had a chance to be around it. And uh, um, yeah, I, I think that that's what was so cool is that there were things that people said that you went, that, that's good, <laughs> that's, that's really good. And then you had things that people said that you went, wow, it, 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 um, it took the breath out of you, right? And we had moments where you wanted to feel like you had to cry because somebody it impacted their life more than just um, more than just being a game. I mean, if you step back. And if you close your eyes and you went back to that day, and then you look at the enormity of what you've heard for the rest of your life around that day, you would realize that, wow, it was enormous. And, um, to the point of it was so enormous that you know it it changed the path of of the 49ers dear mr clark my father's been a 49ers fan since he started training at travis air force base in 1969. he loved san francisco and its football team and planned to return one day but the war was still going on and a gunship squadron was waiting for him in the train by the time you and Joe and the rest of the team had come together, the war was over, but my dad wouldn't be there to see you. As a matter of fact, he'd miss your whole career with the 49ers. He was a POW after Saigon fell till 1986 and wouldn't make it back to San Francisco till 1990. 10 years of torture, starvation, and dead friends hurt him, still hurts him but he fought for his life and survived. And when he moved into tiny Park Merced apartment, he still brought home the sporting green section. K-12 
catching up on all catches and comebacks, and the team he'd followed as an Air Force cadet. When his son came along a few years later, he changed diapers with KNBR in the background. I grew up loving his 49ers and you because you guys were hope and happiness and a chance. You were an ideal to my dad, to a poor third world kid whose life earnings couldn't buy the shoes the Air Force issued him. To me, the catch is bittersweet because of the joy it brings my father who couldn't see it. But he wants you to know this. We can't get what we want or deserve sometimes. We can't even get what's fair, but we fight on for the people that came before us, that fought beside us. The children we love and whose lives we shape look to us for the battles we fought and how we fought them. You're as inspiring now, fighting for your life, as you were when you came down with that pass on sprint right option. You remind me of my father. Brian Dew, San Francisco. came down on the field. Uh, I think Carmen Policy came down with me. He was in the, um, in the um, end zone. Um, and I, I, I was standing there, and I knew the drive was going on, and there wasn't much time left. And uh, I, was, I was behind a horse. You know, they had, they had all the police were there and they were all on these giant horses, and uh, they, were, they, they were all over that end zone area, and, and uh, I mean big horses. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, everybody exploded in the stadium, and the policeman exploded himself. He, everybody, you know, was screaming. And I said, well, what happened? And he turned to me, he said, uh, Dwight Clark just caught a touchdown pass from Joe, and uh, that's my, that's how I, I saw or didn't see the catch. On January 10th, 1982, my mom and dad, Don and Margie Foley, were present for the NFC Championship game at the Stick. Like the other 60,523 fans who were present, and the other hundreds of thousands who claimed they were, the catch changed our lives. On his way out of Candlestick Park and through his euphoria, my dad ran to the spot where you leapt into the air and landed and grabbed the biggest piece of turf he could find. He kept it for more than three decades, and at Christmas a few years ago, he gifted me a bag of turf. Today, for the first time, I have opened that bag of Candlestick grass and have repackaged some of that turf for you. I must say, it's an honor for us to share this memento with you. As you can tell, some of the grass and dirt have turned to dust, but you can't miss that distinct 49ers red paint. That piece of grass in the corner of the end zone became sacred ground as far as the Foley family was concerned. All I can say is thank you. Thank you for all the memories. Thank you for being so nice to me that one night we met and treated me like you treat a friend. My dad is now 82, and when I told him that I would have the chance to share this turf with you, he cried. That's how much the catch and the 49ers meant to him and my family. Matt Foley, San Rafael, California. Dwight was just in awe of, of that that, you know, he had a piece of candlestick turf right where he caught the catch. I remember he, uh, <laughs> everybody was talking about, you know, that's how neat that was and great that was. And he, in typical DC fashion, he looked around the room and he said, don't any of you guys get any ideas, this is going with me. To hear him say he wanted to take it with him, uh, you know, to take a part of the moment with him, to take a part of all of these stories with him, uh, to take a part of all of the fans and all of us that were part of it at the time with him. And Dwight took that bag of turf with him, clutched in his hands. It's a memory I'll never forget. That special piece of turf where he landed 
with that ball in his hand. He wanted that to be with him as he soared up into the stars and into heaven. So that day, he said, can we get a book out of this? And I was very noncommittal. Didn't want to make any promises, but I, I told him we could do a documentary. Um, it's been a while since I've seen that one. Because of that documentary, this book is now happening. So. Um, it's been received very warmly. Um, all the proceeds go to the Golden Heart Fund. One of the things Dwight said in his bedroom that day was anything that comes out of this, make sure it takes care of my guys and his guys, his former players, former teammates. And he said uh, the, the Golden Heart Fund is what he, he wanted to direct any of the proceeds to. Golden Heart Fund is a charity that the 49ers alumni came up with. Uh, Eddie DeBarlo gave a million dollars in seed money. The York family gave a million dollars in, uh, in seed money as well. And so it supports former 49er players in times of financial, emotional, and physical need. Um, I've known Dwight. I knew him for 25 years. Uh, he was the 49 general manager when I first started covering the team. And he was just so gracious to me and I'm still covering the 49ers probably because I had so much fun in those early years covering him. Uh, he made it fun um, and so I still have that passion to, to cover the team and, and that's what I do now. Brad Mangin, you saw the, the great photos from Dwight's bedroom. Uh, Dwight entrusted uh, Brad to to shoot pictures of him with some of his former teammates, and he can tell you a little bit about that now. Thanks, Matt. Um, I hope you all enjoyed what Matt and his uh, co-workers did at NBC Sports Bay Area. The documentary was really amazing and done in an incredible short amount of time after Dwight's passing, and it really fulfilled Dwight's wish. Dwight wanted people to share with him the catch, as you saw. He loved hearing the stories, and, um, and he always wanted to help his guys for the Golden Heart Fund. And he had such a great relationship with his teammates and his former coaches and fellow office employees whoops, that, he, that he worked with um, when he was later the general manager, that when he lived down in Capitola, after he was diagnosed, he started having these lunches um, every Tuesday at this restaurant near the beach, um, the Paradise Beach Grill. And these, these lunches were organized by our good friend Kirk Reynolds, who used to be 49ers PR guy. And Kirk got me to start documenting these lunches in January of 2018. So for eight Tuesdays in a row before Dwight and his wife Kelly moved to Montana, I would go to these lunches and sometimes there'd be eight 10, 12, 15 different folks that play, former players, coaches, sometimes office secretaries, women that work with Dwight. 
and you know, I had to earn trust. I'm hearing incredible stories. There's no video there. You know, I, in fact, it was to be inconspicuous. I shot everything with my iPhone. I do a lot of, I'm an actual real photographer. I shot my first 49er game in 1986. Shot hundreds of 49er games, but with the iPhone, I wasn't some guy with a real camera. There were all the other, a lot of the other players were are like my age or older, and they were taking pictures with their iPhones. Um, so I was around a lot, heard a lot of stories, was fortunate to go up to Montana. About a month before we did, Mr. DeBarlow had a two-day reunion organized that was amazing after Dwight had moved up there. And a bunch of us flew up there from the Bay Area. Other players flew from all over the country, spent two days with Dwight, and we could see that he was declining. And by the time we made our trip up there, a month later, on May 20th, we were supposed to meet Dwight for lunch at a restaurant on a Sunday at noon, and the big highlight was Matt had brought the letters. And when we found out that Dwight was not gonna be able to, to make it to the restaurant, that we were gonna have lunch ourselves and then go to Dwight's house, and I had actually brought a real camera with me um, and then we get there and Dwight was in bed and he was breathing into an oxygen mask and it was, it was a pretty heavy scene and I immediately left and put my camera in another room and we just sat around for a while as Dwight's face regained color, he, his smile came back because he was with his guys telling stories and I didn't take a picture for about an hour and a half as the stories were told, Dwight's mood improved when he was with his guys and it was a safe area. You know, it was, it was pretty big, as you saw the smiles in the, in the pictures. So I ended up shooting all these pictures with my iPhone because again, I couldn't be just that guy with a loud, annoying camera. And finally, after about an hour and a half, his face just lit up and he looked at Matt. I mean, you saw Matt sitting in those pictures. He said, Matt, you brought the letters. And he just, God, he couldn't wait to hear them. And Matt passed them out. And um, it was, we were there for about three hours. And uh, <laughs> when we left, we knew that things were not good. Uh, but we also knew that we'd been a part of something pretty incredible and special. Yeah, he, he passed away uh, two weeks after. Uh, you saw those photos in the bedroom. Uh, we knew that his, his health was declining. Um, what, what, what I found fascinating about the whole thing was that, you know, how many letters on very short notice, how many letters were, were sent to me. Um, and all those people were, you know, all the, the, they all made the point of, of how important Dwight Clark was in their lives, you know, through these kind of life-changing seminal moments in their lives. Either it was that moment in time on January 10th, 1982, or the, the reverberations felt after that play and what it meant for family. Uh, some people hadn't been born at the time of the catch, but had met him at, at certain places. And, and so he was, he was always there for the fans. He was always, he loved to hear the stories. He loved to ask questions about those people's stories. And so God, the, my takeaway from this whole project, from this whole uh, interaction that I had with the fans is kind of serving as a conduit to then uh, delivering these letters uh, to Dwight Clark, where we sat around and read them, was that, that Dwight was, was always there for the fans, you know, as on the field as a player, very good player, more than just that one catch, but off the field as well. And when Dwight really needed it, the fans were there for him. And uh, so many people after the fact said, man, I wish I'd sent a letter, you know, and, and I'm just sure there's a lot of people who feel like, oh, I wish I had sent a letter. 
What, what I think happened in the room that day was, I mean, he always kind of had an idea of, of the impact of that play and how he connected with fans. But I think everybody who could have sent a letter, their sentiments were reflected in the letters that were read to him that day. And w when we left there, knowing, unfortunately, that he wasn't going to have very many more good days ahead of him, I tell you, the fans came through for Dwight. And it, it made that day, just two weeks before he passed away, it, it brought a smile to his face. It, it, it helped him on a day where he needed help, on a day where he didn't have the energy to get in his wheelchair, when he didn't have the energy to go downtown and, and meet uh, us at a restaurant, in a day where he did not get out of bed, he needed something like that. And, and that's what the fans delivered in, in a big way. And uh, to, to be able to take that stack of letters in and at lunchtime, just hand them around the table and see, see Ronnie Lott reading letters and going, oh, I want to read this one. <laughs> and, you know, put the, uh, the RL in the corner and put that one aside and to see Keena go, oh man, this one's so good. Can I read this one? Yes, KT, that one's for you. And then when we got in that room and I had that, that stack of letters to be able to, you know, to, to hand Ronnie Lott his stack of letters and Keena Turner his stack and, and, and Brian Murphy, who's, uh, you know, not, not afraid to uh, say any word. Uh, <laughs> I guess he isn't on the radio, he doesn't. Uh, he, he has to keep it PG. But some of the more uh, colorful words that Dwight got a, a big kick out of those were those were Murph's letters you can you can deliver the punchline on this one Murph and, and he did um, and the the amazing thing about uh, the the turf was that we didn't read this to Dwight or we didn't express to him at the time because we we wanted to keep the the letter reading a far as far removed from ALS as possible. But that family, the Foley family, is an amazing family. And, and they've been uh, impacted by ALS like no family should ever be. Eight people in, their, in that family have been diagnosed um, and, and suffered from ALS. So, so that, and that, is, that made it into the book, kind of the background, but that's why uh, this was so impactful for them to be able to share that turf with Dwight and then the reaction of, of Dwight um, having that turf in his hands and immediately saying, I'm taking this with me. And to kind of hear that and go, does that mean what I think it means? And yes, it did mean exactly what, what we all know it meant. So that right there kind of tells you uh, the impact that, that the letter writers had on Dwight. And this book is the, the thing that I'm, I mean, I'm thrilled with it because Brad's photos are phenomenal. Michael Zagaris, a uh, long time 49ers photographer, his photos are some that have never been seen before other than by himself. <laughs> uh, John Story with the great cover photo of capturing that moment. Uh, of the catch, and then um, Eddie DeBarlo, Ronnie Lott, Joe Montana, Kelly Clark, and Brian Murphy uh, all wrote essays as well. So this is a book that um, it's a story that doesn't change. You know, it's it's a story. It's the first time what happened. The story behind the first time that the 49ers uh, went to the Super Bowl. It's a story much more than sports, and it's a book it's a story that will will live on forever so I, I just want to thank everybody here for for coming and and I hope you and do do enjoy uh, the book letters to 87 and I, and I think I'd like to open this up to any Q&A if anybody has any questions they have for them yeah, one over here. How many letters did you actually receive? 
it was about 130 letters. Um, I think 118 are in the book. Uh, we, we sent out uh, uh, permission slips to all the letter writers. Some, some of the letter writers just, uh, there were some very personal uh, letters shared and some people didn't want their letters in, uh, but 118, I'm, I'm listed as the author of this book, but what, what I believe and what I say is that I'm really not the author. There are 118 authors in this book. The, the letter writers uh, make this book as great as it is. What was your time frame? Of you know, when, when you yeah, so when, when Dwight, I, we talked on, I believe it was February 20th for a podcast that he wanted to do with me. I drove down to, to Capitola to his house and it was at that point on this podcast that I did with him, he said, I've always wanted to, to see those letters, put a book together. And on the spot, I said, well, gosh darn it, let's do that. I'll put the word out and we'll get those letters, you know, and I'll send them up to you in, in Whitefish because he was just getting ready to move to Whitefish, Montana. So that was uh, mid to late February. And then we went up there on May 20th, 20th. May 20th, 2018. So there wasn't a whole lot of of turnaround time. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, where were you when the catch? <laughs> I, I, we both have our stories. You want to go first? Um, I was actually there. I was a uh, senior in high school in Fremont and still had my ticket stub to prove I was there. I was my uncle from Redwood City. His he had a business that had a bunch of season tickets. Some in um, upper. Upper Reserve Section 36, which is on the Niner side around the five yard line or 10 yard line. I was up there and then some of our other family was in Lower Reserve Section 8 or 10 behind the visiting dugout. Um, so I was there with my parents, my aunt and uncle, cousins. Um, I was there the week before for the Giants game as a fan also. Um, so I was there, I saw it, it was amazing. I was in my uh, living room in Corning, California right off I-5, all of the capital of the world. Um, and I grew up in a time, uh, and I don't really remember those games in the early 70s against the Cowboys, but I knew of them. And I was conditioned to, whenever it looks like things are going well for the 49ers, they're, they're really not going well. There's probably a penalty flag that will be, uh, you know. And so I was actually thinking, and this was in the days now before on the screen, the big, you know, yellow flag, you know, <laughs> so you didn't know. So I was convinced that there was gonna be a holding penalty on that play. And so I didn't start to think that it was actually truly a catch until Ray Wershing waddled out there and, <laughs> and kicked the go ahead extra point. And then I just ran around our, our yard for several minutes after that. <laughs> Any other Anybody questions? else? Pete, anything? <laughs> that could be another book, though, too. That could. There we go. Where can people see this documentary? It, it, you can find it uh, because of the, the rights uh, of some of the photos. Uh, we at NBC Sports Bay Area, we bought the, the rights for the photos for 10 years, so it can be shown. It'll be shown on TV occasionally, like on anniversaries and stuff. But if you want to watch it, like right now on your phone, uh, just Google Letters to 87 documentary. It'll be on the NBC Sports Bay Area's website for the next 10 years. Or yeah. for everything Letters to 87, there go, go to letters to 87.com, which is an all encompassing website that I built that's got the documentaries there, everything is there. Pictures, all of Matt's stories, every story he ever wrote about Dwight and everything that happened. There's tons of information. A lot of pictures that no one has seen from the lunches that I did in Capitola. Everything, letters to 87.com has tons of cool information. And also there's a fan gallery, so uh, don't give away any top secret information by having a photo taken on these grounds. But when you get home, if you have a photo with you and your book or a family with the book, uh, do hashtag on Instagram or Twitter hashtag letters to 87 uh, in, and we'll post and we'll it, post in it on, the, on that website. Did he have a family, any children? 
He did, yes. Um, do you want to talk? To you? He has a daughter, Casey, and she's the oldest child, and then sons, Mac and Riley. And Riley, and they all live in, it's the North? Yeah, they're in the North Carolina area. North Carolina area. area. And uh, that's from a previous marriage. And um, um, we're in contact with the whole family. We didn't just do the book. It was like, and he's got an awesome brother, Jeff, who lives back there also. And his wife, Kelly, is still in, in, um, in Montana. So we all had different, had met, some of us had met different members of the family. And then his dear friend, Rick Winters, who's in the documentary, Matt had a good relationship with Rick. So what, like, we didn't just do this stuff. It was like, you know, the documentary happened with everyone's permission. And then we went to everybody's like, we'd like to do a book. Is this okay? And so everyone was involved. Everyone got updates and knew what was happening and supported what we were doing. Yeah, and, every, and thankfully everybody liked the project. And you know, we, we went up to Montana to do the documentary. Uh, Kelly could not have been more gracious. She's like, tell me whatever you need or you don't even have to tell me. Just you have the run of, the, of our property, of the house. If you want to take pictures, video of anything, fly that drone over our house or whatever it is. So uh, everybody was very supportive of, of that project, the documentary, as well as the book. And also, Ms. I'm sorry, and also, very importantly, Mr. DeBartolo. Mr. DeBartolo, yes. Yeah, it's about 10 miles away. Yeah, technically, Mr. D is in Kalispell, which is right next to Whitefish. So, yeah, it's a little ways away. That was, yeah, that's, what do they call it, the barn? The barn, and it's just incredible. Not a barn. It's, it's not it's, a barn. It's, I know what a barn is. That is not a barn. That's where we had the two-day reunion in April that they flew us all out to. The first night was a dinner at this hotel called The Lodge, which was not just The Lodge, it was really nice. And the second night, the dinner was at The Barn, and it has a catered kitchen and all this, there were all these, and it was this amazing place. And also, where Mr. DeBartolo buried some of the ashes and had that um, tribute to Dwight, there he has the goalpost from the end zone catch or built in his, on his property. I did a, it's not in the documentary, but it's in the book. Um, one of the cool things during the reunion in April, we got everyone to go down to the goalpost and we did a beautiful group picture of everybody that was at the reunion and it's in the book. It's really cool um, getting everyone down there. Uh, just leave it to Mr. D, he's got everything, you know. It's not just a goalpost, it's the goalpost. And, and when, yeah. when Candlestick was demolished, the city owned Candlestick. And so uh, Mr. DeBarlo put Carmen policy on it. Get the goalposts and don't tell the York family we're getting the goalposts. <laughs> and so uh, a number of different shipments, I think that goalpost was cut up into a hundred different pieces and then I don't know who I know it wasn't Mr. DeBarlo, uh, reassembled the goalpost there. But between Mr. DeBarlo and Carmen Policy, they can get anything done. <laughs> they can take care of anything. They could fit into this place. I think they can. <laughs> and they, make, they can make stuff go disappear. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know if Kelly, that was, in fact, that was one of the things Kelly said when we walked in was, do you want, you know, do you want to take a picture of the, the vase where his ashes are? I know she gave ashes to Mr. DeBarlo, some of which he, he had buried in that monument. He has another uh, vase of his ashes in his, in his office that he keeps with him. Kelly, of course, does. Um, I don't know, um, I don't know where they've been spread, though. So why did they move to Whitefish? I mean, he wasn't going to live that much longer. It seems kind of. Yeah, I think um, Kelly wanted to raise horses. Uh, that was kind of her passion, and 
I, I think Dwight <laughs> felt like whatever she needed, you know, he, she's, she's younger than him. Uh, she, you know, made some significant sacrifices there in the last couple of years that he was very aware of and, and very cognizant of. And so I, I think once, um, once he had the, the, the wherewithal as far as the settlement from the NFL, I think it made sense for him to kind of look after her, uh, knowing that, that she has you know, a full life ahead of her and, and however he could kind of give her a, a push start uh, for her next stage of life. And it, it helped that Mr. Bartolo lives half the year half the year in Tampa and half the year in Montana, and that Mr. D and all his support staff would be there. So that would, that also, I don't think he would have, well, who knows? I don't think it would have happened if Mr. D wasn't there. Anything else? Well, thank you everybody for coming out today. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'd also like to thank Brad and Matt for coming out and sharing your stories and preserving that legacy of Dwight Clark. We really appreciate right, that. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming.